Good morning, church. My name is Colby Gray. I'm the evangelist for the West Region of the London International Christian Church. And later on this year, together with my wife, we're going to be leading a team to Edinburgh, Scotland to plant the Edinburgh International Christian Church. Men who dream. I have to ask, are there any men who dream here today? You see, that song is actually my favorite song in the kingdom because I'm a dreamer. I'm dreaming of our inaugural service in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm dreaming of our 100th baptism in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm dreaming of London reaching 300 disciples. I'm dreaming of the mission team to Berlin, to Rome, to Lisbon, to Mexico, to all the different cities all over the world. I'm dreaming of the first man that I appoint as an evangelist. I'm dreaming of baptizing my son and my daughter, Colby and Kiva. I'm dreaming of my 50th wedding anniversary. I'm dreaming of changing cities. I'm dreaming of changing countries. I'm dreaming of an evangelized Europe where you can travel to any country in Europe and there'll be disciples waiting to greet you. There'll be disciples in the cities, disciples in the countryside, disciples in the mountains, disciples in the beaches, disciples in the Mediterranean, disciples in the Baltics, disciples in all of Europe. You see, I'm dreaming, but what about you? Do we have any dreamers here today? You see, London is a city of dream killers. Has London killed your dream? Well, the truth is, London didn't kill your dream. You did. You made the decision to give up on your dreams. You made the decision to stop wanting to do great things for God. If that's you, I have one thing to say to you. Change your mind. I'll never be a leader. Change your mind. I'll never be fruitful. Change your mind. I'll never go on a mission team. Change your minds. My family will never be baptized. Change your minds. I've always been this way. Change your minds. I'll never overcome. Change your minds. The title of my lesson today is Change Your Minds. <laughs> Point number one, the ability to change. I want to teach you guys something uh, that you may or may not be aware of. So it's the concept of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity, it comes from two words, neuro meaning brain, and plasticity, which comes from the Greek word plastos, which means moldable. So neuroplasticity literally means a moldable brain. You see, the way that your brain works is that your brain is made of billions of grooves in your brain that send electrical signals from one part to another. The more you use these electrical pathways, the stronger they become and the larger they become. The more you use them, the easier it becomes to use them. So the more you think a certain way, the easier it is to think that way. Now, neuroplasticity was first introduced by an Italian psychologist by the name of Ernesto Legaro, and this was introduced in 1906. So, this concept has been around for over 100 years. Now, in the 80s and 90s, most people that studied out this concept, they believed that neuroplasticity existed primarily in children. But then, later on, whenever you became older, you became, your brain became less moldable, less shapeable. It became harder, and it became more difficult to change. So the idea is that you want to change the younger you are, because the older you get, the more difficult it becomes. Now, one of the areas where this is most obvious is in language learning. So for those of you that don't know, is that uh, I had the privilege of growing up in Southeast Asia in the country of Indonesia. Now, my parents, they moved to Indonesia, and they wanted to learn the language, so they enrolled in full-time language school, where they would go to class to study Indonesian for eight hours a day. I went and played basketball. <laughs> That's how I learned the language. 
I went. I was the only white guy on the court. I was the only guy who spoke English on the court. And so I learned the language. And my sister, who's younger than I was, she even learned it even faster and better than I did. And you see this with children. The younger they are, the more quickly and the more easily they are capable of learning languages. And so what this did is it produced this concept that you kind of need to, to change early on in life. At first they thought it's, oh, before puberty. And then they said, actually, no, 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 there's another spike that happens from the age of 20 to 30, where you're in that period of time where your brain is extremely soft and extremely moldable. But then they thought, like, after 30, you're kind of stuck the way you are. <laughs> this way of thinking existed until about 20 years ago. And in the last 20 years, modern research has thoroughly disproved this fallacy. See, what neuroscientists have proved consistently time and time again is that the brain retains its neuroplasticity throughout your life. So what that means is any person at any time in their life has the ability to change their brain. I'll say that again. Any person at any time in their life, whether you're 10 years old, 20 years old, 50 years old, 70 years old, 101 years old, your brain has the ability to change. And this has been proven time and time again. This is good news. You know why? Because sometimes in life, we do stupid things. We make bad choices. Has anyone in here ever made some, some bad choices in life? So, something that's important to, to hear, an inconvenient truth, is that those choices, no matter how big or small they are, are actually shaping your brain. So, when you make a bad choice, that damages your brain a little bit. And when you make a bad choice repeatedly, it damages it more and more and more and more. See, I made some bad choices. From the age of 13, I was completely addicted to pornography. Every day, looking at pornography. And then this really got out of hand in university. It got so bad at the point of university that I nearly failed my university degree because when I was under pressure, when I needed to study for my exams or when I needed to work on assignments, instead I would look at pornography. Sometimes like all night long. I would look at pornography and then write my paper a few hours before it was due to be handed in. And I'm not the only one. You see, there's actually a growing community against pornography online that's secular. They're not religious. They're not Christians. They, they don't see pornography as, as morally wrong. They just see it as bad, bad for your brain. This community's grown and on Reddit, there's a subreddit of 850,000 men who are all working together to try to help people recover from porn addiction and sex addictions. See, what these men all recognize and what science has shown is that porn damages your brain. What it does is porn, it triggers a rush of dopamine. Dopamine is the driving hormone. It makes you want to do things. It creates that desire, creates that satisfaction. And what it does is it dumps dopamine into the prefrontal cortex, the very front part of your brain. And what this, this is the exact same thing that smoking, drinking, drugs, gambling, they all have the same neurological effect in that they, they rewire your brain by triggering repeatedly these massive amounts of dopamine. But what this does is it creates very unnatural, harmful neural pathways in your brain that make it more difficult to, to enjoy life. Is that men who have been addicted to pornography for long times report not enjoying life, like not even being able to, to sense things like, like food. Like they say that even their, their sense of taste and their enjoyment of food becomes less because of the neurological damage that's happened to their brains. See, what pornography does, by, by viewing hundreds and thousands of these sexual images, what it does is it makes it impossible for us to be in any sort of meaningful relationship. It makes it impossible to stay, stay faithful, to be committed in a, in a relationship. Now, I share this with you because for 
more than 10 years, I systematically rewired my brain in one of the most damaging and harmful ways by habitually, consistently looking at pornography, consistently creating these toxic new neural pathways to damage my brain, to, to lessen my other senses, to, to inhibit my ability to form relationships, whether these are romantic relationships or even platonic relationships. I, I would feel more distant from other men when I would look at pornography. I would just feel so ashamed, so dirty, so inadequate. After doing this for, for a long time, 10 years is a long time, but when I got to, to university, when I got to my 20s, I, I really tried to change because like these young men, I realized how, how toxic this is, that this is really not going to be helpful for my life long term. Like I don't want to spend the next 30, 40, 50 years of my life living this way. I see the damage in 10 years. I can only imagine what it would be like in 50 years. So I tried to change, but I couldn't change. I would read books but I couldn't change. I would listen to podcasts, but I couldn't change. I would attend self-help groups. I would go to, to, to religious gatherings. I would get accountability partners. I would download software for my computer, but, but I couldn't change. Maybe you've done some bad things to your brain. We don't really think about that. We don't think that drinking alcohol habitually damages our brain. We don't think that smoking uh, cannabis damages our brain, but it does. And it, is, it, has, it doesn't, it's not like a, not just a physical effect, not just an emotional, but no, a physical, it, it physically changes the makeup of your brain. And so if you've done these harmful things, I've got good news for you. Your brain can change. See, after trying all these different ways of changing and none of them worked, I became a Christian. And guess what? I stopped looking at pornography. Guess what? I was able to have, for the first time in my life, a meaningful, faithful, committed relationship. And I'm very proud to say that just this week on Friday, I celebrated my four-year anniversary with my lovely wife. And that's not the really cool part. The really cool part is, is that in our marriage, I've not looked at pornography one time. On. My brain has literally changed. These neural pathways that I formed over years of, of habitual sin have been replaced with new neural pathways. And so I say that to you to give you hope that anyone can change. And I'll prove it to you. See, the Bible actually proves that what I'm saying is true. You probably didn't think that neuroplasticity is in the Bible, but it is. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. You guys are going to like this. This is super cool. Matthew chapter 18. My car was worried I wasn't going to bring in the Bible. <laughs> trust me, trust me. The, the Bible's coming. Don't worry. Matthew chapter 18, in verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Many of us think that we change after we come into the kingdom of heaven. But no, no, that's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is backed up by science. See, when do people have the greatest amounts of neuroplasticity in their brain? When they're children. When are we the most able to learn? When are we the most able to change? When we're children. But what happens is, is that over time we grow up and we lose that innocence. We lose that purity. We lose that humility. We lose that joy. We lose, that, uh, we lose all of these wonderful qualities of children. But Jesus says something amazing. He says that we can change. See, you can change your brain. You can go back to regain that lost innocence that you once had as a child. You can regain that lost enthusiasm, that lost joy. You can regain that lost humility. You can regain that lost intimacy. All these things that you lost, you can change. And the great news is, you don't even have to be a Christian to do it. 
See, you change before you enter the kingdom. See, many of you disciples that you still think, I can't change, I can't change, I can't change. You're wrong. Because you know what? You did change. Remember when you studied the Bible? Remember when you changed who you were so you could become a disciple? You could get baptized? You could join the kingdom? You changed! But here's the thing. We don't stop changing after we join the kingdom. You continue changing. You continue going after to have this heart of a child. What does it say in verse 4? Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be great, and that's okay. I want to be great. I'll say it. I want to be great in the kingdom. I want to do great things for God. How do you do this? You have to have the heart of a child. We have to go back to having this heart of someone who's ready to change, someone who's humble, someone who's grateful, someone who's joyful. See, people in the world understand this, and they change. Many people, they change a lot. And that's what I said, is that you don't need to be a Christian to change your mind. Far be it that people in the world are able to change their minds more quickly and more radically than those in the kingdom. See, you may be thinking, oh, that's great, Colby. Yeah, I love that you were able to change. You overcame porn. That's really cool, but, 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 I, but, but I'm different. Oh, really? Oh, really? Please explain to me how you are different than every other human being on this planet. Please explain to me why your brain is unique and your brain somehow functions separately from everyone else's brain. See, everyone else's brain has a concept called neuroplasticity is capable of changing, but you're special. Your brain doesn't have that concept. Your brain isn't capable of changing. Please explain to me, if you are a disciple, how your emotions are more powerful than the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. You see, I get so angry because I hear these lies repeated time and time again by my brothers and my sisters in this room. It makes me indignant. And you know why? Because I get the same lies you do. Like, I'm not different, I'm not special. I get these satanic lies in my head, you can't change, you're not good enough, you're always gonna be this way. You see, but I have a conviction that many of you do not have, and I wanna urge you to embrace this conviction. Okay, are you listening? Take this down, write this down. I have a zero tolerance policy for Satan's lies in my life. I have a zero tolerance policy for Satan's lies in my life. I don't tolerate them. I'm not okay with Satan's lies. I identify them, I reject them, and I live by the truth. Many of you guys don't do that. You don't like Satan's lies. You try to dismiss Satan's lies. You try to avoid Satan's lies. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a drug addict coming into your home and just living there. Now, I, I have a family. I have two small children. If someone is injecting heroin in my living room, I'm not okay with that. I'm not going to avoid it. Think like, oh, yeah, there's a drug addict. Just, just, he sits in the corner. He doesn't bother anyone. Just like, no, I'm going to call the police. I'm going to get that person out of my house. But that's what it's like. You have these satanic lies in your mind that you don't deal with. You just like, you just pretend that they're not there. You're like, yeah, yeah, those are those lies. I, I know that my disciple says they're not true, and I know the Bible says they're not true, but I'm just like, just gonna like turn my back to the lies of Satan and pretend that they're gonna go away. It doesn't work that way. See, I'm gonna give you guys all a warning shot right now. For those of you that want to live with Satan's lies in your head, I can't, I can't control you. If, if you want to live with satanic lies, that's your choice. I wouldn't recommend it. But this is a warning shot. Don't come to me looking for pity. Don't come to me with a sad story about your epic victimhood because you know what I'm going to tell you? I'm not going to shout at you. I'm not going to slap you. What I'm going to tell you is very simply, you're wrong. 
And this leads me to my second point. Point number two, you're wrong, God's right. To the brother who wants to come to me later on this week and be like, bro, I'm just never going to be able to change. You're wrong. For the sister who's like, I've just always been this way and I can't overcome. You're wrong. You're wrong. Let me teach you something else about the brain and the way that the brain works. So there's something called the reticular activating system, RAS for short. The reticular activating system, it's something that sits at the top of your spine and connects to your brain. It's about two inches long, and it's the width of a pencil. So it's very small, but it's very important. See, what the RAS focus, what it functions as, is it is a filter. See, in the world around us, there is way too much information. It would overwhelm our brain. So what has to happen is we have to filter out most of what the world is. And I'll prove it to you. Okay, so I want all of you guys to take your right hand. Now, I want you to focus on your right hand intently. Look at it. Don't look at me. Look at your right hand. Look at it. I want you to focus on every detail in your right hand. Okay? Now put your hand down. I got a question for you. How many lines are in your right hand? I'll tell you. Yesterday I was prepping this lesson. I was like, okay, I got to have an answer for this. So I I, I looked and I I counted all the lines in my hand. (laughs) There are 123 lines in my right hand. And those are just the really obvious ones that I can see. See, your, your brain, it has to filter out most of the information in the world because it's so overwhelming. There's just so much information just in your one hand. If you were to look at all the lines and all the details and everything, if you were to look at all the lines in the floor, like, wow, there's so much going on. So your brain has to suppress all of this stuff. And what the RAS does is it focuses on the only thing your brain wants to focus on. See, you control your RAS. So that means your brain focuses on what you tell it to focus on. And it will avoid everything else you don't want to focus on. So if you choose to focus on negativity, your RAS will filter out everything positive in the world to where you can only see negativity. I want you to to think about something real quick. So I want you to think about someone taking a lemon and slicing that lemon in half and then taking that lemon and squeezing the juice in your eye. Now, check this out. This is really cool. No one squeezed a lemon in your eye, but your brain reacted like someone did. You, you, like someone said, ouch, ouch. Like, no one did anything to you. But, but check this out, check this out. Your brain doesn't know the difference between reality and a lie. Your brain doesn't know what's true. That's crazy. How crazy is that? There's this hormone called oxytocin. So this hormone, what it does is it increases uh, love and trust and empathy in relationships. So one of the ways that you can release oxytocin is by uh, hugging someone for 20 seconds. Now, uh, that's a long time. Like most hugs are like two to three seconds. And if you go really long and uncomfortable, it's like five seconds. But I want to do a little activity with you guys, okay? So I want you to uh, close your eyes, and I want you to think about someone that you deeply, deeply love, okay? And now I want to imagine you taking that person and squeezing them, okay? And don't stop picturing this until I tell you, okay? Ready, set, go. Go.
Okay, you can stop. Here's what's wild. Your brain releases oxytocin when you hug someone that you love physically for 20 seconds. But if you just think about hugging someone for 20 seconds, your brain also releases oxytocin. And what I imagine is that many of you, after you saw it, you, you felt a little bit better, right? That's the oxytocin being released in your system. But how crazy is that? It doesn't matter to your brain whether you physically hug someone or you just think about hugging someone. It still works. It still releases the oxytocin. 90% of your life happens subconsciously. It happens without you even thinking about it. Because again, your, your brain is, is overwhelmed with all this information. Your brain is overwhelmed with all these decisions. And so your brain is constantly trying to simplify your life. Your life is based on a pattern. We would call this our habits. Everyone lives based on a pattern. And most people lived on a sinful pattern or a worldly pattern. But the Bible, once again, it speaks about this. So if you turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is, again, very, very cool when you see that the Bible matches up with science. You see neurology in the Bible. See, this Greek word here for uh, do not conform is the word suse uh, kamazo. It means to conform oneself to another's pattern. And it comes from this root word schema, which means habits. So what it literally is saying is do not follow the habits of other people in the world. A lot of us know that this is wrong. And so what do we try to do? We try to change our habits. And that can work. I mean, that's what people in the world do, and they're, they're relatively successful at that. You can see people, they develop new habits, there's books written about it, that's wonderful. But trying to change your habits is the fruit. If you really want to change, you must change your identity. I'm gonna teach you guys something uh, else. This is, I, I'm a teacher, I love to teach people stuff. So in neurology, there's this concept called cognitive dissonance. And it was first introduced, uh, it was written about by Leon Festiger in 1957. So dissonance, in cognitive dissonance, what it basically means is in your brain, when your beliefs are not in harmony with your actions. And what it does is that you feel discomfort. And studies have proven people even feel physical discomfort. Your brain makes your body tense up your muscles. It releases cortisol in your system, which is a stress hormone, that increasing anxiety. There is a physical reaction to cognitive dissonance. And the reason for it is that your brain does not like dissonance. It doesn't like when our beliefs are out of harmony with our actions. And so what it does is to remove this discomfort, you're forced to either change your beliefs or your actions. Now, our biggest source of our beliefs come from our identity. Let's take smoking, for example. If a person believes that smoking is bad, yet they choose to smoke, they're going to have incredible amounts of dissonance. And they're going to feel really uncomfortable, even physically uncomfortable. They'll feel very anxious. They'll feel stressed, maybe have headaches. And so what they'll be forced to do is they'll force to either change their behavior and stop smoking, or change their beliefs, where they say, actually, smoking's not really that bad. It's not really great, but I, I exercise, and I eat a healthy diet, so, so smoking's not really that serious for me. 
So our brains are constantly either trying to, to adjust our beliefs or to adjust our behavior to avoid this dissonance. And this works in the negative as well. So if you believe I am a prideful person, in order to avoid dissonance, your brain will actively oppose you being humble. You can, you can try to be humble. Like D time comes around, you try to be humble, but your brain is going to be opposing you. If you believe that you are a lazy person, when you try to work hard, your brain will actively oppose this because it wants to avoid dissidence. If you believe I am a selfish person, your brain will actively oppose acts of selfless kindness. Until very recently, I had a massive problem with Coke. Now, I'm talking about the drink, not the drug, thankfully. <laughs> So, for those of you that watched uh, the Euros football, football championship, Cristiano Ronaldo came out very famously at the, the beginning of the championship, and uh, he removed the Cokes from the table, and he held up a water, and he's like, water, drink water. And as I watched that, I was like, oh, man, I should really, should really stop drinking Coke. Man, as I poured myself another glass of Coke, I should really stop drinking Coke. <laughs> Because I didn't really believe that Coke was really that bad. I was like, man, I'm not like overweight and I like, it's, it's okay. But you see, I was actually very addicted to Coke where I would drink it every day, sometimes multiple times a day. And I, I would use it if I would get uh, angry, if I would get tired, if I would get discouraged, if I was bored, I would just turn to drinking Coke. And so three weeks ago, it was about two weeks after this press conference, I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop drinking Coke. And I told Sean, I was like, Sean, you keep me accountable. I'm not going to drink any more Coke. And I really, really tried not to drink Coke, but then it only lasted a few days. And then I had a Coke and I was like, oh man. Because that dissidence. So then what happened was, is that you're like, you know what? Coke's not really that bad. If you drink Coke, I'm, I'm happy for you. But I believe I'm not a person who drinks Coke. That's not who I am. I'm not going to do that. And so what happened was that two weeks ago, we uh, were, were rushing to go up to Edinburgh to scout out the land, and we got some food, and I went to Boots, and I got a meal deal. Now, to make the most of a meal deal, you got to get the drink. And I didn't want the, I didn't want the juice, or I didn't want anything else, and I, I saw there was, there was shining with the, the light overhead. I got the Coke, and we got on the train, and I, I eat my food and everything, and I have this Coke sitting in front of me, and I look at it, and I was like, I, I don't want to drink that. And I was like, man, like, I, I paid for it. Like, it'd be really silly to, like, throw it away. It's like, okay, okay, I'm just going to drink this, and then uh, no more, no more after this. And so I started drinking it. and felt terrible. And I drank about halfway. It was like, man, can I just get through this Coke? I don't, I don't enjoy this. And then I got about two-thirds of the way through it, and I was like, okay, let's just finish it. And I just downed it, and I threw it away. I, was, I felt enormous amounts of dissonance because my behavior was not in line with my identity. Wow. See, I truly believed I'm not someone who drinks Coke. So when I started drinking Coke, I felt very uncomfortable. And you know what? In the last two weeks, I've not drank Coke once. <laughs> but, but that's not even the cool thing. The cool thing is, is that I've not wanted to. Because to avoid dissonance, my identity forces my behavior. My, my, these two things have got to be in a line. So I was like, okay, I, I go, uh, I would usually I would go out to a, 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 caf, a coffee shop, pret a manger or something, and I don't really like coffee, and so I would get a Coke. And I, I've gone to these coffee shops every single day and not even wanted to drink Coke. Now, I say this because this is like a, a relatively trivial thing, so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, but this works for everything. This works for anything in your life. Your brains all work exactly the same. There's no exceptions. Your brain is constantly looking for harmony. It's constantly looking for a pattern to follow. I was talking to uh, the, the Bible Talk leaders about this 
last week, and uh, then uh, I shared this with them. And one of the sisters, she said, oh, that's great. Well, uh, I really want to try this, but, uh, you know, easier said than done. I'm like, excuse me? She's like, easier said than done. A little less confident the second time. <laughs> and I was like, okay, sis, uh, where's that in the Bible? Easier said than done. See, this is a satanic lie, easier said than done. Because if you believe it's easier to say it than to do it, your brain will actively resist you doing it. If you believe it is difficult to change, your brain will make it difficult to change. If you believe it's in, you are incapable of not changing, your brain will make it impossible for you not to change. Because our brains are all following a pattern. And this is exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says that we need to change the pattern of our minds, not follow the habits of the world, not follow the world's patterns, not follow Satan's pattern, but to follow the new godly pattern. And where does that come from? It comes from the word of God. That every day that we are reading the Word of God, we are applying it in our life, we're making conscious choices that are going to force this new pattern, new neural pathways in our brain that are going to change us. See, this is amazing, but a lot of us have heard this already. We have something called discipling in the church that most people don't have, and they have to pay large amounts of money for it. It's called therapy, it's called life coaching. It's, that's, what, that's what people in the world do. But we have it for free. We have incredible, wise, intelligent, loving people that disciple us. And many of us have already been told what we need to change in our life. And many of us have also been told how to change it. See, that's what I start off with. I start off with what you need to do, you need to change your mind. Neurologically, it's possible to change your mind. How are we gonna do it? You need to follow God's pattern, not the world's pattern. But this is not very important. The most important thing is why we change. One of uh, the new motivational big thinkers is a guy by the name of Simon Sinek. He's a best-selling author and motivational speaker. He's spoken at the UN, TED Talks, and, and many other things. And he was actually born in Wimbledon, London. This guy's a Londoner, and he actually has discovered many things that I think are very, very evident here in London. He has this concept, which he calls the golden circle. He says... On the outside of the circle, you have this big thing called what. Then inside that circle, you have a smaller one called how. And then at the very center, you have why. And most people, what they do is they go from the outside in. They say, here's what you need to do, here's how you need to do it, and here's why you should do it. But that doesn't really work. See, what we actually need to do is we need to start from the inside out. And this is why I've done this point last because I want us to leave focused on the why. Because when you have the why, the how and the what are natural. They're inevitable. They just happen. So I want to talk to us about why. I want to talk to us about the reason for change. Now, the Bible actually gives us this region, reason in the previous verse, in Romans chapter 12. I hope you're still there. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, a sacrifice was an animal that would be killed, we put on the altar, and would be burned. But the Bible here says, no, no, we need to become a living sacrifice. Now, you can imagine how unpleasant that would be to choose to subject ourselves to these purifying fires. Most people don't want to do that. You, you're a living sacrifice for a day, and then you're like, that was really unfortunate. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> but what it says here is that every day we need to be a living sacrifice. Every day we need to be renewing our mind. Every day we need to be establishing these new neural pathways, this new pattern that dictates how we live our life. Now, many of you agree with this. You want to do this. So the question is, why are you not? The reason is why. Your why is not strong enough. Now, many people have lots of different whys. You look at the world, and these whys have various levels of success in being able to change their life. 
Some people are motivated by their family, by their spouse. Their, my children are my why. My brother is my why. My neighbor is my why. Simon Sinek, he's my why. <laughs> and people have different uh, motivations, even in the church. Like, let's not laugh at them. Let's think about us. Okay, my ministry is my why. My discipler is my why. The person I disciple is my why. World evangelism, that's my why. And none of those things are bad motivations. I'm glad that all of those things motivate you. But none of those are sufficient to truly produce this change, this daily renewal of our mind. They, they only get you so far. See, the Bible says the only thing that is sufficient to sustain our why is the mercy of God. So what I, yeah, you can clap for that. What I would put before you, and this might sting a little bit, so just, just brace yourself, okay? What I would put before you is that if you are not changing the pattern of your mind to become more godly, it's because you don't understand the mercy of God. Wow. It's that simple. Because God's mercy changes us. And if we're not changed, it means that we're not impacted by God's mercy. We're not impacted by God's grace in our life. If you turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, the truth is, is that Jesus is our why, specifically Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And I personally, uh, whenever I do the cross study with someone, I like to add the scripture at the very end to really remind them of this, is that this has got to be our, our life scripture as disciples. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14, the Bible says this. It says, for you, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. What's our why? Our why has got to be Christ's love that compels us. It forces us. The Greek word here, what it's talking about, is talking about a river guiding a ship. Like the ship, as it travels along the river, it's compelled to turn with the river. It has no choice other than to run aground. And this is us, that we're compelled by Christ's love. We're compelled by his death on the cross. This, it says that we are convinced we have a, such a strong belief that it produces cognitive dissonance in us. That because we believe so strongly in the love of God, when we don't share our faith, it makes us physically uncomfortable. Because we believe so strongly in the love of Jesus, that when we don't deny ourselves, it makes us feel uncomfortable. When we don't respond in humility, it makes us uncomfortable. When we don't respond in patience, it makes us uncomfortable. Because of our belief in Jesus. Jesus died for us to set us free. The word that's used here is the word bondservant or slave. And I think that this is the problem. And I realized this, I, I convicted myself as I was preparing this lesson, realizing that many of us do not have the identity of a slave. A slave cannot do anything without their master's permission. And if we really believe that we're slaves of Christ, we'll think twice before we indulge in sin. We have to ask Jesus' permission. Jesus, I want to make sure it's okay for me to numb out with YouTube right now. We have to make sure that Jesus is okay with us sinning. That's how we think. And if we go against our master, Jesus, our Lord, it's going to make us feel so uncomfortable. And that's what many of you guys feel. And that's actually a good thing, is that if you're living in sin and you feel so wretched and terrible, that's a good sign. You should be alarmed when you stop feeling bad. Because what it means is that your behavior has changed your beliefs, where you no longer fear God. You no longer fear hell. And what that, you've got to allow that uncomfort, that, that pain that you feel to change our behavior back in line with our beliefs. See, the Bible says something spectacular right here. It says that we are new creations. We're new creations. 
That includes our minds. Our minds physically change when we become disciples. This is incredible. And I've I've personally witnessed this when I've studied uh, with people who have very strong CR backgrounds, who have strong drug abuse backgrounds that they they physically damage their brain, but then they become disciples and things become incredible. Their memory increases. Their cognitive functions increase. That's a miracle that comes from Jesus. Jesus makes us a new creation. Jesus enables our brain to change. No one else does that. Nothing else does that. And this has got to be what changes our behavior. I want to give you a challenge. Tomorrow, I want you to wake up and I want you to go back over the notes that you've taken today. And I want you to do them in reverse order. I want you to go with point three, point two, and point one. You've got to start with why. Once you understand why, once you truly understand your identity, and maybe you just need to reaffirm your identity. You're like, you know what? I am a slave of Christ. I am a disciple. I've just not been living like it. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a disciple in the workplace. I'm going to be a disciple in my marriage. I'm going to be a disciple with my family. And once you reaffirm that identity, your behavior will automatically change. Your brain will force you to change. Start with why. This is the most important part. This is why I'm doing this last. Because if, I, if you forget everything else that I said, remember this. It starts with why. And you need to figure out your why. If you're here for the first time, I want to challenge you to study the Bible so you can learn about Jesus' sacrifice for you. You could truly understand why you should change your brain, why you should change the pattern, why you should change your actions because of Jesus' love for you. In closing, I'll share a quote with you. It says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. This is by Carter G. Woodson. And the context of this, he was speaking about slavery. And he was speaking about how the slave owners controlled the actions of their slaves. Because in America, America, slavery was so rampant, so widespread. But there's no major slave revolts in American history. The slaves never rose up against their slave owners because the slave owners understood if we can just control their thinking, we can control their actions. See, all of us were slaves at one point or still are slaves of sin. And Satan, he wants to control our thinking because if Satan can control our thinking, he will control our actions. This is why this is so important. Why do we change? We change because of God's mercy in our life. We change because of grace. Jesus died for our sins to give us a new, to give us a new identity. Hallelujah. Praise God that we have this new identity, that we can become a new creation. How do we change? We change by having a new identity that comes from Jesus. And this then creates a new pattern that our brain is going to follow. And because of the pattern that is on our brain, it will control our actions without us even realizing it. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be literally rewiring. We're going to be physically changing our brains to be better. Church, I want to challenge you. Change your mind and change your actions. I want to challenge you, change your mind, change your life.